Nostalgia Pod coming at you, giving you your weekly look at what's going on in pop culture. My name is Patrick Sheehan with my co-host Dave Martin Swagger, who is rounding up the Tim Chalamet hive after <laughs> a huge trailer drop, which we're going to talk about in a second. Dave, how you doing today? Good evening to everyone except Emma Watson, whose accent, American accent, is quite poor in a Little Women trailer. But other than that, I'm ecstatic. Looks amazing. How are you doing? I'm good. I I, I really liked the trailer. Um, I, Emma Watson didn't even stand out that much to me in it. So uh, I've seen that, that take out mine. I'm a little bit uh, surprised by it. I was just happy to see her uh, with that, that cast. Obviously, uh, Sir Sharon and Timothy Chalamet, uh, Florence Pugh, Meryl Streep, Laura Dern. Who am I forgetting? Yes, Liza Scanlon. Um, Little Women. Yeah, going to be uh, incredible. Coming out on Christmas, probably one of the few period pieces I'll go see in theaters. So uh, looking forward to that. Uh, also looking forward to talking about quite a bit of music and TV today. Before we start, hit that subscribe button if you're on YouTube. Go to soundcloud.com slash nostalgia pod to find all the ways to take in this podcast. Give us the five star rating review on iTunes. Why don't we start with Social House? Everything changed. Debut EP from this producing and and writing duo, who's uh, probably most well known for helping out Ariana Grande with "Thank You Next" and Seven Rings, and just some other production on her most recent album, "Thank You Next." It, Dave, you really were the one that brought this to my attention that they dropped this debut EP. I'm wondering, how, what was your temperature on it? How were you feeling about it? Yeah, the thing with this was I actually didn't realize they dropped an EP until literally today. I just thought that a Boyfriend single with Ariana, which debuted number eight on Billboard, obviously a really big release as soon as it came out. But I thought that was just a one-off song. I didn't realize they were releasing some other music until I actually just stumbled across that. Um, and it's funny is they really don't have much of any music to their actual own performing credit uh, to speak of. I mean, they have the Magic and the Hamptons song, which is pretty big uh, gold single for them featuring Lil Yachty, uh, which is kind of funny. It's been like a, that's like a slow burn song that kind of grew on people. I think got on some playlists, got some radio buzz, but never actually charted despite going gold off the streams, which is kind of interesting. But yeah, they have like they have like one other loose single, and then they just dropped this EP and this big song with Ariana. So I was kind of surprised to see them lean into being uh, performers, you know, in front of the in front of the mic. So, uh, so soon, I guess, I don't know. Cause they, I knew that I saw they were opening up for Ariana on her sweetener tour, which has been going on for months. And that was initially like a big, like uh, like eyebrow raise to me. I was like, the magic and the Hampton dudes, they have like two songs. Why are they opening up for Ariana? What's the deal with this? Then I realized they're obviously, as you said, they're really close friends and collaborators. So I guess it makes a little more sense. And apparently, uh, one of them, Mikey might be dating Ariana right now. Who's to oh. say, um, good for them. But Going into this EP, I didn't actually have much expectations. You know, I thought that I like the bi- boyfriend single when I heard it. I like Magic and the Hands when I hear it, but I didn't really have any idea of what these guys were as performers going in. Like, and I don't think that's changed. That in turn, like, did you think Social House has a performing uh, musical identity after this EP? Uh, my favorite song off the EP was "At Least We Can Say We Tried." Was that it? <laughs> first one yeah and um that's just kind of how i feel about this album at least i can say that they tried there's really not much that stood out to me at all with this like you said their identity doesn't really show off it really just sounds like very generic uh hip-hop pop uh music right now um i i appreciate the you know their, their collaborations with ariana boyfriend was good obviously thank you next is fucking banger um and Seven Rings, also awesome song, but these two just don't really feel like they have a voice or yeah. any anything really that they're building off of. It seems like you kind of felt that way as well. <laughs> yeah, I think they're, my, my whole vibe with it was just they're generic, inoffensive performers making kind of stakeless top 40 pop, you know? And I guess they have a little bit of versatility. They can 
get a little softer as we heard on this, but yeah, in terms of like who social house are as, as musicians, I, I, you know, they kind of have the issue that happens with a lot of uh, people that are behind the camera, the start, they kind of struggle once they are performers, you know, some people are just producers or just writers and I'm not trying to put these guys in a box, but I'm just saying, despite having two solid ass singles now and boyfriend and magic and the Hamptons, I just don't know if they're, but anything special about them as performers but they clearly are respected as songwriters and producers they have quite the list of collaborators apart from ariana so it's not like these guys are gonna disappear their sign is gonna no. be brawn so uh we'll be hearing from them for sure but as a first uh impression for for a lot of people i think the leading you know being carried on this boyfriend single uh it's probably just gonna go in one year and out the other for some people but you know it's low stakes, so maybe people like just throwing it on or won't skip it when it comes on, but nothing too special. Yeah, n- nothing too special. They might be better behind the scenes for now. Uh, someone that is propelling himself into the the foreground in a lot of spheres is Blueface, who also dropped his, uh, was his debut EP, Dirtbag. And uh, Dave, give me a little background on Blueface because... Uh, you've been standing him a little bit this year, and I don't know <laughs> if I if I can do it justice. <laughs> we talked about him a fair amount with uh, XXL. He obviously made it this year, which made a lot of sense because, of course, Tatiana, massive, a viral hit this year that actually came out at the end of last year. And on top of that, Blueface is a really charismatic, uh, funny guy. He likes to play into the memes and the bits and stuff. So he's kind of kept himself in the uh sphere as Thadiana has begun to crest and that's uh, i believe it peaked in the top 10 but obviously it's way down now that the moment it has since passed and you know, the mm-hmm. remix has stopped but along the way we had a cardi b remix yg remix and blueface was doing a lot of uh smart tactical features along the way the west coast song which he easy did really well and he had a few other hits right before Thadiana, like dead lokes and uh studio and it seems like he was going to be, uh, you know, a West Coast, um, I don't want to say a superstar, but certainly a face in West Coast rap. And I still think that's the case. But this Dirtbag uh, EP definitely underwhelmed me because it's not his first project. He did have two tapes last year. That's where Thadiana's from and those other hits. But his first, you know, release this year. And um, I just think the thing, the issue with Blueface is that he's kind of acknowledged this too online is that he doesn't try that hard. And he's certainly not alone in uh, the contemporary rap scene in that regard. But uh, he has some flows that can sound very repetitive when he does them four times in a row. And even though that flow, you know, the offbeat flow, he's kind of gotten a lot of notoriety for, uh, I usually don't mind it. But when I hear it song for song, it's like, come on, guys, it's a little, it's a little much. And I thought the, um, in particular, the, the very last track with, uh, or second last track with Mozzie, releasing a Moz feature gang, which is clearly just trying to replicate what Studio is doing, but that's just an auto tune mess. That sounds bad. <laughs> so I think that there, there's some like decent moments, but in terms of, you know, the, the, the brief blue face catalog we have right now, I think this is the least essential of his releases so far. What did you think as someone who's way less invested than me? <laughs> yeah. Um, I thought a lot of the lyrics on this were just straight up bad. Um, it, the the not really trying very hard definitely comes through. Uh, on Bleed It, got to keep a technical in case a person hack it. <laughs> and then never let the beef get cold. Where the meat at? Uh, no, the, the best the best part <laughs> you ever had though was on a stop capping. Uh, how can I be slipping around the one doing the mopping? Fucking <laughs> <laughs> um, bus down, or you used to take the bus down. Now we're bus downs. I mean, yeah. I can't say any better than that. Ooh, <laughs> fire! Uh, Singed my eyebrows off with those. Uh, yeah, I mean the one the one thing I will say is he he brings energy to his songs, and um, he has some pretty big collaborations on this. You know, yeah. Offset um, and Rich the Kid. I thought both turned in pretty good performances uh it's not 
it's not the worst thing I listened to this year. Um, you know, we, we just talked about social house, which I definitely would say is worse than this, but I just don't, I don't get the, uh, the blue face hype at all after listening to this. That, that, that Tatiana's pretty good, but after right. that, yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I think bleed it, which came out back in January. It's the oldest song on this. I think bleed it is perhaps the best blue face song. That's just the best in terms of just him competently rapping. Um, and it was, on beat rapping at that i think that was one of the first times people like oh blueface there's a little more going on with him so i'm still like in on blueface as a rapper but yeah this just felt a little just a little rushed a little uh just kind of superfluous and funny enough i mean the the cover is really bad and the album cover ep cover and if you look at it it says blueface and there's a space between the e and the f blueface is one word but it looks like on his own ep cover his own name is misspelled, which just kind of fits the brand. If we're being honest, um, <laughs> and that brand just being a meme, being being someone who doesn't take anything that seriously, him collaborating with Little Pump makes a lot of sense. And I actually yeah. thought that song was pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, overall, I was uh, I was I was underwhelmed. So I'll wait yeah. For that. And that, uh, also, just reading some reviews online, I think that seems to be the general consensus. It's a lot of people just feel a bit disappointed by this. Uh, Hopefully his next project's a little more well refined. Right. Spends a little bit more time with the pen. Uh, someone very refined in the biz, Rick Ross, Rose, dropping Port of Miami two. Thirteen years since his debut album, Port of Miami one. I guess we we'll call it one. Just Port of Miami. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've been talking about Rick Ross a little bit. Uh, you know, he dropped the songs with Drake after the Toronto uh, Raptors championship. Uh, I can't recall the name of the song, but he's he's been money fe- in the grave. Yeah, money in the grave. He's been fe- featuring a lot recently, um, and listening to this album, the first half kind of left me with where I'm at with with Rick Ross, which is I think I like him more when he just kind of drops in out of nowhere and adds something. But then the second half of this album, there's like a point. Um, I think maybe it's after Big Time. I'm not sure. I, I want to go back and, and really pinpoint what, where the song was, but where the back half of this album really finds a groove. And I really enjoyed it. I was pretty impressed. Um, I think it was actually when, uh, after Fascinated. Fascinated through the end of the album. I was like, ah, the, he really seems to find something there. Um, I was pretty impressed. I, you know, Especially, I think, after listening to the other two rap albums we talked about this week. Uh, this was a nice brush of fresh air to have someone confident and... <laughs> I don't know. How did you feel about Port of Miami too? Yeah, so this is definitely my favorite Rick Ross album since uh, God Forgives I Don't, which came out oh. in 2012. Uh, he released a lot of albums between these two. And I, I just kind of, I've been out on Ross as a album artist for quite a while. Yeah, let's see. Uh, Mastermind, Hood Billionaire, Black Market, Rather You Than Me. That's four records I think are just pretty pretty valueless there's really not a whole lot going on on those and at that this whole i held that at that time you know the, the mid 2010s i guess uh i was just kind of out on mmg i was out on meek at that time i thought meek was being really uh repetitive as well and this is right, this is right as the drake piece about to happen and never was a wale guy so i was just kind of out on maybach music as a whole and then ross as you mentioned kind of just started picking up hot features the past two years or so which were catching my eye obviously because they were good and then the fact that he actually could kind of uh catch a, a bit of his past glory and i think like i said best album in seven years uh was refreshing and it's funny i i think rick ross has actually kind of overall been overrated as like an a-list top tier rapper and mm. i think that actually bears out if you look at the sales he has five number one albums a debut at number one you know demonstrating immediate interest in him being popular yet only one of those albums actually went platinum so hmm. his staying power as a solo artist i think is a bit questionable and i don't think port of miami 2 is going to change that i don't know if there's any massive hit on this again he hasn't had a massive hit in quite some time but He's always been around and he will continue to be around because he's just respected as one of those OG figures. And I agree. I think the the back half of Port of Miami 2 is pretty pretty impressive. Songs like Vegas Residency really stood out to me. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and it does feel like he actually started having something to say again. I think, you know, that health scare he went through comes, comes to mind. Um, you know, I think he reflected a lot on Meek's situation, given how close they were. So it's interesting or, or inspiring to hear Rick Ross more inspired because it just felt like he was phoning in for such a long time. I'm just happy he's, he's back to a, a good spot. Um, were there any other songs that you thought stood out to you in that back half or in the beginning? Yeah, I really liked um, Big Time with Swiss, Swiss Beats um, yeah. and running, running the Streets with Denzel Curry and A Boogie, I thought was pretty hot too. Obviously, Denzel Curry, you know, my, another Miami guy. Uh, pretty, um, yeah, I, I just like, I think, more when he's upbeat and he, he does switch between upbeat and more like melodic yep. uh, R&B type songs on here. Um, you know, even something like Summer Rain, uh, I thought was pretty good. Act a Fool, I really liked a lot. And the the production on Fascinated is really, really just uh, impressive. And like the way that they like take the keys and just kind of like create this ambiance around it. I was really like, oh, this is, this is some good shit. And, um, you know, I think you summarized really nicely kind of like the, a lot of people's overall feelings towards Ross and not that he's not respected, but just he got complacent, I think, a little bit. And that's not to say he this, his stuff was bad, but I think it was, you know, just not memorable. Um, and it's nice to see him kind of be able to take songs where, like Vegas Residency or Maybach Music 6, where they're songs I enjoyed and it's just him, no features. And he really seems like he's finding a little bit of what – he likes pop music what what inspires him right and you know again first time in a while there was some virality regarding a ross album in this case it was the push a t verse that ross took off maybach music (laughs) six that subsequently leaked online that uh release day and you know it was funny that ross initially was trying to mend the good music cash money uh rift as it were and then he decided this wasn't going to do anything, so he's going to keep it off. And if you hear that uh, push first, pushes uh, talking about clowns and uh, ability and talent and stuff. So Push T is certainly not pulling any punches, but he also didn't seem uh, mad at all that that happened. So definitely a funny moment for sure. But yeah, I'm just happy Ross is, uh, it, it seems like Ross is, this is a nice culmination, uh, coronation of, feature run he's been out we've been eyeing this and expecting this moment to happen it happened which is great just a question for you what's your favorite like either ross feature or just song featuring rick ross in general i have a clear favorite sure sure sure. um i think my favorite ross song is probably uh stay wait stay stay scheming a ross song I really like Stay Scheme, which he's on with French and Drake. That's because Drake disses uh, Joe Budden on that. Um, I mean, obviously, I like Hustle, and obviously, I like um, Blow Money Fast. Uh, those are obvious ones. Uh, underrated Deep Cut, I think, on God Because I Don't. is so sophisticated. One of my favorite Meek flows ever. Um, yeah, uh, Three Kings on that one as well. Uh, 16, yeah. great Andre 3000 feature. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, Mastermind, that al- first album that I didn't like, uh, has sanctified, which was the first Kanye West feature in about two years post Yeezus, which I uh, really liked at the time for obvious reasons. Yeah. But yeah, what, what's yours? Well, uh, even though it's it's a Kanye song technically, "Devil in a New Dress" just the the way he comes in at the end there just steals it every time for me. I actually listened to that song just to get to that that final piece. The whole song is fantastic, but Ross just absolutely slays on that. Um, what would Wu-Tang do, man? I mean, that's the question we should all be living by. Uh, and what would Bonnie Vare do? Someone else that uh, helped out on My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. Lost in the world. <laughs> and uh, surprise drop, his new album, I, I. Um, it, it, it dropped it in an interesting way. Um, you know, he had already kind of picked a date later on in the month to drop this and just kind of started posting tracks until finally he's like ah here's the whole thing and uh i was happy he did because well i wanted to have more to talk about the pod this week frankly but also i i was actually looking forward to this you know we talked about 22 a million back in 2016 and i think our take on it was uh it's a lot to digest 
It's very obscure. Track names are dumb. Yeah. Um, and he kind of continues that a little bit on this, uh, or Bonnie Vare, the, the band does, but really it's Justin Burton's vehicle for right. his own mood or however you want to describe it. But I found this album so much more enjoyable than 22 a million. And it feels a little bit like a return to where Bonnie Vare started with, uh, for Emma forever ago back in 2008. Um, before we get too far into what we liked or didn't like, how do, how are you feeling about it? Do you like it? Uh, yeah, I did like it. This was actually really uh, unexpected for me. I was just kind of throwing it on. And the way I threw it on is I made a playlist of all the songs he put out. Because as you said, he just released them all as singles at first. And it was everything except the intro track. And a day later, he puts it out as a full album release on streaming. So I like, went on Genius. I was like, oh, what's the order of this? Let me put this in order. So I can listen to this and we download this. And I was like, it was actually kind of fun to to have to be more manual about it. So that's what I did. And yeah, I'm listening to it. And I'm like, all right, some of these songs are just kind of weird, warbly, uh, folky shit that's not for me, what I expect from mm-hmm. Bonnie Bear. So I just let it go. And then there's some other songs. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. This is actually pretty sick. I'm surprised I like this this much, given yeah. where my tastes usually lie. So yeah, this is uh, by far my favorite Bonnie Bear. Uh, <laughs> now that says much of anything. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoyed a lot of it. Yeah. You know, Bonnie Vare is really interesting because they are s- such a, uh, a mysterious band in a sense, almost, you know, like, like you said, their track names sometimes don't make sense. Even the way Justin Vernon sings a lot of the time, um, you can't understand exactly what he's saying and you're trying to like decipher it. The lyrics don't always it's make almost. sense. <laughs> Yeah, Bonnie Vare and Blueface, uh, the the next hot collab for sure. Um, But as I was listening to this, I think what I liked more about this album was it seems a little bit more straightforward. You know, something like Skinny Love, where Bonnie Vare first really blew up back in 2008, that's a song that doesn't really mince words. It doesn't leave you questioning too much. And I the songwriting on this and the the clarity in Justin Vernon's vocal delivery um, just really seems like he's either more confident or in a space where what he's writing about, what he's singing about is coming from a more assured space. And it really, I think shown through to make this album uh, just a more cohesive and uh, a lot more enjoyable listen than something like 22 a million, which is so, I don't know, it's like a Jackson Pollock in a lot of ways. It might, it might be good, but it's just like, yeah, what am I really looking at here? Yeah, I think that's well said. Um, tell tell me about the songs that you liked. Yeah, I had three that really stood out to me. A few of these were already out before this big drop, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, You Man Like, mm-hmm. and uh, Naheem. Naeem? Yeah. And Naeem yeah, I thought uh, You Man Like just stood out to me, just, you know, being upbeat and more, uh, uh, just more engaging for me uh songs like big 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 popular arguably one of the like three biggest bonnie bear songs at holocene is it um mm-hmm. yeah that that shit does nothing for me like that, that's the kind of shit i just i, I just don't want to hear because because it's too, too soft too mellow for me but these songs i thought were certainly not that and then uh naheem in particular or naeem i would say it um man i was I like that voice though that word yeah. actually was really nice it's good acoustic guitar on there. Then the piano keys come in. Then at the end, there's a lot of nice drums. Um, we like that production. That's really layered. And that song kind of reminds you why Justin Vernon's such an impressive composer. Just because yeah. there's a lot going on in a song like that. Um, so those are three that stood out to me. What else did you like? Yeah, I think you really talked about the, the major ones for me. I, uh, I thought the closer... Uh, Rabbi was pretty good. Um, I also like the song before the closer, uh, Sh- Shida. 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 Uh, um, what, what I really like Shadia is it, it reminded me, especially in the ending, it has this like long saxophone outro basically. Um, it reminded me a lot of like a, a Joni Mitchell song in, in a lot of senses. You know, it, it had this very like folky feeling, it created this airiness to it, and then it had this long 
uh, horn section or, or horn solo to really end it. I was like, huh, seems like he's really pulling some ins- inspiration from, he's such a modern or the Bonnie Bear, such a modern group that had to pull from a legend like that, or at least kind of steal a little bit of that sound was cool. Um, yeah, just looking through the credits, he had a couple of, of big name people collaborating with him on this, but um, the only one that I really noticed, I think was Moses Sumney. Right. Who uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember which song it was. I think he was on uh, I am I, which I thought was a pretty good song. Um, I, I really enjoyed the whole list. And I think cohesively the album flows together really well. Um, but I do agree that there's certain songs that stick out. Hey Ma, the single from this, um, I think immediately becomes one of probably Bonnie Bear's best songs up there with like Holocene, things like that. But yeah, overall, just a really, really impressive uh, drop fourth album from Bonnie Bear. Um, I, I'm hoping, I would really like to see uh, him do a little bit more producing moving forward, you know, cause he kind of comes in and out, but I feel like the touch he has, and you talked about like the way he assembles songs um, and composes them. is just really impressive. And he works really well with hip hop. Strangely, you know, we were just talking about him on my beautiful dark twisted fantasy. So I'd like to see him do a little bit more of that as well, but I'm sure we'll be hearing from Justin Vernon and Bonnie Vare more. Something we hadn't heard from in a while though. Secession. Number one boys, baby. Back again. <laughs> yeah, a session. What, what was this? Our favorite HBO show? Well, definitely, last the, year? definitely the best HBO show last year. I believe you had it one. I had it, I think, three. I had Atlanta and Killing Eve just above this last year. But uh, undoubtedly top tier show from 2018. Yeah. It's. It, it's funny because uh, I think when we talked about it on our sub list and also as our season wrap up, it was a show that at first and then it kind of hit its stride and uh, it was just much must watch every week. And, uh, you know, I, I've kind of gotten in the groove of things where if I, if I don't feel like a show is essential, I'd rather like catch up and watch two or three episodes at a time. But Secession, like Game of Thrones or... Um, you know, like uh, I'm trying to think of another show, well, just like that. And this is kind of this is kind of leads into the monoculture talk a little bit, but it's one of those shows that can grab the attention. I don't want to miss because I want to be a part of the conversations. I want to be following the story that closely. Mm. Uh, how are you feeling just coming into the season two? Were you ready for it? Yeah, I was very very jazzed for sure. Um, I was I enjoyed season one really from the start, but as you said, there was an un, undoubtable undoubtedly there was a build up as the show progressed, as I think as by the actors felt out their characters, as the writer's room kind of fleshed out where they wanted to take things, Succession took several leaps in season one. And then by the last, probably last three episodes or so, it's just firing on all cylinders. And it was such an engaging uh, season. It ends, honestly, fascinating mm-hmm. place too, with obviously uh, Kendall committing vehicular manslaughter, like a Ch- Chappaquiddick style incident and having to crawl back to Logan as a result. And season two starts right off with that. And yep. of course, the other main characters don't know about this accident. And that, that, that's a, obviously a thread we have moving forward. And Kendall is now back on, uh, back in the saddle, for sure. Uh, he needs a straightener while he's dealing with all this mm-hmm. stuff, of course, you know. And uh, I think it, it uh, really put the... Uh, Narr- refocus the narrative for everyone where we brought all the characters together and Logan, Brian Cox is just a central figure for the story once again where he's incapacitated or just kind of acting for the know, first like three episodes. Curious in the beginning, right. So I think we've really refocused and now we know that there's uh, some other narratives with other media companies coming in we know holly hunter is going to come in soon as a rival uh, ceo for company you know and uh, the guest stars seem to be uh, built up as well danny houston comes up in this premiere so it really feels like jesse armstrong and crew just know exactly what they want to do with this and these actors know what they're doing with these characters so yeah i'm, I'm super excited for where the season will go yeah the uh, what I was most excited for in the premiere was just to kind of get everybody, everybody back together, like you said. Um, 
but obviously season one ends kind of with them all going in different directions. Roman's dealing with the fallout of the, uh, the satellite launch. And Shiv, Shiv and Tom are on there going to their honeymoon. Uh, Kendall obviously is going to rehab somewhere and just to get out of the spotlight for a while. You never know what's going on with Greg the egg and uh, same with Connor. I mean, yep. Connor, you never know. For president. What, okay. Yeah, sure. Um, and they found such an interesting way to like pull them back together. And it's, it was also really funny to like start the season with Kendall at this Icelandic <laughs> resort treatment center, whatever it was you get pulled out and you're kind of like, how long has it been? And then he's like, Oh, I've only been here two days. And you're like, wow, we're really just starting like right from where we left off almost like no gap in time. And they all get sucked back in as uh, the, the news of the coup, the, the bear hug, I should say. Um, of course comes out and uh jeremy strong playing kendall in this almost like deer in the headlights kind of way throughout the whole first episode i thought was was excellent um and just kind of like seeing him like deal with that internal struggle of the character like so tactfully where he's like you know trying to like assimilate with his family and like be a normal human being when this totally unnormal thing happened to him or right yeah, it's an abnormal thing happened to him. It's pretty, uh, pretty impressive stuff. Also, just you know, where do you get three raccoons? Like, where do you? How do they catch these raccoons? How do they stuff them down the chimney? Just a lot of questions about the raccoon. Yeah, those contractors, man. Who, yeah, you can't trust them. Um, but a lot of good stuff. I was wondering, how did you feel about the stuff with Shiv? Because she's being positioned as like a right. major uh, player moving forward. Oh, for sure. I think the scene with Shiv and Logan, like alone in the office where he tells her he wants her to be the successor and she's the clear clear choice, the only choice, all that. I think that's the best scene in the episode and yeah. really highlights because we don't expect Logan to be playing straight with anyone. Obviously, we expect some kind of betrayal or uh, backstabbing to occur. And uh, who knows, maybe he gave uh, fucking Roman the same offer. We don't know. Uh, but sure. that really highlights, I think, uh, how cunning and cutting uh, Logan is. And you see Shiv, who's, cl- who's always been the, the most adept of this whole crew. You see her actually give in. And then because she knows her dad, she has to ask multiple times, is this real? Yeah. And just kind of just reminds you of where they all are and how none of them can play straight with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Roman w- wouldn't dare say well, how would he really felt just before at that uh, you know, dinner table. And again, we get a reminder of the kind of shitty people they are when they just throw out that big spread of expensive ass food because it was uh, in the presence of a scent from the dead mm-hmm. raccoons. And you know, I, I've always what I always liked about the show, and I think if you actually look at it beyond the the soap opera stuff and the uh, the thrilling aspects of the story, which are great on their own, it's not just saying, "Hey, rich guys suck." You know, it's a kind of it's kind of sh- showing its worth, which I've always really liked about it, and it just felt like the show picked up right where it left off, both literally with the plot. Obviously, it's a few days later, but like in terms of the rhythm of everything, uh, it seems like we're right there. And obviously, we didn't get a whole lot of Tom or a lot of <clears throat> cousin Greg this episode. That's fine. We know they'll they'll be coming. Uh, we'll get more of that, but even still, we got part Coke. So I was happy with it. Yeah. yeah. The the interesting thing about the park Coke was like the immediate thing Kendall did where he touched the outside of it. And he was like, what is on this? Like, don't want to know what was on that park Coke. Man. <laughs> my septum uh, falls out. You have to eat my septum. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. The, the scene with Shiv, you know, the remember this moment, the slant of the light. Uh, it, it was, uh, it was really memorable. And it, it really, I think you, you spoke to uh, highlight what the show does so well, where it puts these characters in these very like human moments, but like there's so much gardenness and deceit that they've been living in, in this like fake world in a way. It's, uh, it's just really, really intriguing and fun to watch. Um, I also really liked the moment with Kendall and his friend and uh, you know, at the end when Kendall has to go tell them that they're not accepting the deal, Stewie. Yeah. And when Stewie's like, what the fuck man. And then he's like, 
he stops and he's like, you know, you can play the friend card. Like you can like, you have basically like, get out of jail free card in a way. And Kendall just couldn't do it. Uh, yeah. Obviously with the stakes for him, but I, I saw dad's plan and it was better. Yeah. Just better like m- m- mimicking the lines he's, he's been given. Uh, yeah. Just the, I'm really excited to have Secession back. It seems like there's a lot of different directions the season can go in. Um, and it's just fun. Like, the, they do such ridiculous things on this show. It's just, it's kind of like Big Little Lies in a way, but just with probably higher stakes. In, yeah. It's, in it's just better in general. Yeah. <laughs> well, especially after season two. Right. Uh, yeah, it's funny, uh, with Kendall, I saw this more than once, people comparing uh, where he's at right now to uh, Reek uh, in Game of Thrones when Theon was at his lowest when he was with Ramsay. Uh, will we get the Theon redemption down the line? Who's to say? You know, I think uh, Jeremy Strong is really great when he's playing Kendall down on his luck, whether he's yeah. high out of his mind or just uh, broken. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, straight man Kendall uh, trying to be the CEO is probably not as interesting to most people. So even if I'm sure we won't get to that point anytime soon. Um, yeah. So I really like the scene uh, in the laundry room where uh, Logan's goon is like, hey, just so you know, uh, a bunch of us actually know what happened. We took care of it. It's not nothing's gonna happen to you, but like oh, yeah. you're fucked. We we know we know like we got you, bitch. So yeah, relax. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Just a secession in general. Excellent show. So excited to have it back. Something I'm sad is gone. Legion from FX had a series finale last night. While we're recording on a Tuesday instead of a Monday. Um, yeah, Legion. So just just to kind of summarize where we're at, because we haven't talked about it too much. We you know we did the series, uh, the season three premiere uh, review, and then kind of talked about why we liked the show then. And just to kind of recap, Legion can be a confusing show. It's a lot about time travel, being inside your head. It's it's kind of almost like Inception in TV form in a lot of ways, but it's Inception mixed with like more psychedelia and just uh it i think that psychedelic part is what shines through is the weirdness of it the style of it the 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 fact that you can tune in any week and see something that you usually aren't going to see on television and shot really well and uh noah holly has i think master manned this helm um and i'm sad it's ending how did you feel about the finale about the final season just kind of legion in general and we'll talk some specifics yeah yeah uh so looking back as a whole on the whole series uh, i think season three is a clear improvement over season two where season two truly got lost in the weeds from a narrative perspective where it was becoming harder to appreciate the visual flourishes and the sheer uniqueness of the style so it was really hard to follow what the hell was going on or why the story was even going in that direction. This when things did happen, they didn't feel that satisfying all that. We've, we've talked about this, check those videos. Uh, three, on the other hand, has a pretty straightforward plot, you know, in terms of what's happening with uh, David breaking bad and Sid and crew trying to stop him and David trying to go back in time to change the past and uh, that's about it to be honest and despite that i think there's still plenty of confusing aspects about about season three but the more i watched the show more i thought about the season as i was watching i just just didn't really care anymore that i didn't follow 100 percent because that's not really why i was interested i was watching the show of course for the great performances like most most shows we watch these days but uh, as we've been saying the visuals are just so unique for tv and just as we I think we said at the top of the premiere, with the way they present phenomenon in the show, uh, characters will fight each other by having a dance battle or in this a case, rap battle. A rap battle. They will tell uh, go back in time through these doors in a hallway of sort. You know, just the, the way they choose to uh, represent represent things. We have Lenny doing some mad mm-hmm. hatter shit in a forest, right? And that, like, in the presence of the astral plane, obviously, it does lend itself to lots of unique uh, visuals and whatnot. And uh, of course, Noah leaned into that. And I think the finale actually was, was nice for wrapping up uh, where we had gone, I think in a pretty satisfying and uh, 
I say tender way. I mean, even if we ultimately just kind of close the circle in terms of going back in time and uh, baby David is now here and at peace and everyone's going to leave each other alone. Uh, I think uh, the, mo- the last moments everyone had in the finale, I think were really touching and pretty effective. So overall, quite satisfied with it. And I think it is, you know, I'm not like, again, because I wasn't really invested in the story any much. I'm not like dying to watch more Legion for that. But I just hope, you know, uh, Ted Sarandos, or uh, just our John, he's Netflix, John Landgraf and FX under uh, Disney now will still green light something that's so out there that they know won't be a ratings darling. Because that's what Legion was, you know, to show that people... Well, only a few people watched and I think it did lose people with season two. So um, I'm happy they kind of returned to form in a certain sense for this final season. But yeah, think? no, definitely well said. Um, I, I think with the thing I was most impressed with it by the end of season three and as the finale, I think so beautifully wrapped up was the story and especially David as a character at times could feel really, really, really big. You know, David uh, in Legion as a mutant has, I think, something like 32 different personalities and would tend, depending on which one is in control, can behave differently. Right. And Legion's powers are, I mean, he's, he's a meta, he's what, mega mutant. So he's like the most powerful one possibly ever in the X-Men comics. It's, it's a character that I think is hard to really boil down. And wh- where they got to and what the, real crux of the show was was repairing your past repealing repairing the wounds of of your past and how those things impact your future um you know as a a major proponent of mental health i I actually was like really impressed with like bringing that message home about like confronting the pains that you've had trying to find ways of of understanding and moving forward and uh, obviously not everybody has the powers that David Haller has to go back and actually change your past. Um, But more of the, the um, more of the metaphor of it, of, you know, these pains, the things that lead you to do things that don't necessarily represent who you want to be. You can confront and change. I thought it was really cool and that you need help to do it. You know, he ended up needing, you know, uh, his dad played, uh, you know, professor X, which I, I thought was a bit of a choice to all of a sudden start making his parents such a big yeah episode three is all them yeah and I mean this is these are characters you don't see for the first twenty or so episodes and then all of a sudden we're following them around pretty closely it's it's quite a choice Um, and I think it landed pretty well um, for how late they were introduced but I thought just the the overall messages Noah was trying to get at um, came through really nicely. So I give him a lot of credit for that and doing it in such a unique way, obviously is really, really cool. Yeah, I agree. And I think um, even Carrie a little bit at the end gets a bit of a, a nice send off. You know, they did, they, they abandoned, abandoned some other characters like uh, autonomy. doesn't really have much to do this season. And mm-hmm. uh, Hamish Link later dies in the season. And, but Carrie, I think, you know, given that the, the unique, situation that the two carries are obviously i think they you know the thing with aging at the end i thought was pretty nice um yeah. even having lenny uh have some grief and not be as detestable and wisecracking at the end uh was an interesting choice I can't say i saw that uh that coming for for lenny and for robert plaza but um yeah. <laughs> I mean, to just kind of to piggyback on what you're touching on, I think every character, even Farouk, who is kind of set up as the big bad and going back and forth, got a redeeming moment or at least a humanizing moment in the end. Um, and no one, I think, is in this series is seen as purely evil or purely good. Like there's, right? you know, it, it's, a, it's a real well-rounded character in almost every sense for almost everybody on the show, which is pretty impressive for a show where, you know, I'd say... 85 percent of the show is based around just david a lot of the time yep. and what's going on with him so pretty impressive yeah i think this is the best sid season easily oh yeah you know, I, th- I think uh was it season one in particular we were really critical of this the writing for sid just because she was really dependent on david for any kind of uh, action to happen for her 
Mm-hmm. And now, uh, even though obviously her, she's still driven by her, uh, you know, conflict with David, um, having that moment where she uh, finds peace with her younger self, you know, um, mm-hmm. obviously the time travel pre- uh, stuff is present throughout. And I think that was one of the best moments for her. And then even um, at the end when Switch kind of thanks her for her service and protecting the world and the timelines and stuff, you know, I think Rachel Keller was really good in these last few episodes. Um, I also really enjoyed um, <laughs> just the Noah shit. Like in episode four, we literally start watching an episode of the shield with Michael Chiklis <laughs> yeah. for like 30 seconds, like just the biggest fucking flex. Uh, mm-hmm. Fucking awesome. A lot of music in this season. You know, uh, the one that obviously sticks out because it's most recent is the Pink Floyd Mother drop in the last uh, last episode or second to last episode. Um, but really, a lot of different musical cues in this. Um, things that really, I think, other shows have tried to do and don't always do to the same effect. And even if sometimes I'm kind of like, oh, another musical cue, I always felt was really pulled in by them, um, which... I thought was cool, especially using, um, uh, I, I forgot what the name is, Captain something, but it was uh, What? That song was like, dan, 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 is like a recall to like certain points and how that kind of came back in the finale with David versus uh, Farouk was really, really well done. Right. You know, it's funny. My temperature was actually pretty lukewarm on the Time Eaters when they first were introduced just mm-hmm. as uh, uh, villains or antagonists. But then once I understood uh, by the end, actually, like that they were kind of like stewards of the uh, of time and space, as it were, um, I, I was more cool with it. But obviously, they stand out just because they're like like stop motion, like like clouds of of dark gas or something, you know. And the way they are uh, shown on screen, bouncing around, and then obviously the way like people are fighting them, whether it's Carrie or or uh, Sid, it's really cool to watch. And then, oh, oh, even on the the, the, the place uh, in between time and space where fruit gets uh, stuck, by the way, where it's like a, a 2D plane almost. Mm-hmm. Again, just really cool sh- stuff to watch. And just seeing a show invert aspect ratios and invert like the dimensions of the camera. Like no one ever does that in terms of just changing the viewing experience. And again, yeah. it's really obvious, like literally showing an episode of an old show. <laughs> but you know, it just, I, th- I think the visual flourishes really stood out for me this season. And it did enough with the characters and the story, too. I think ultimately be pretty satisfying. And even, you know, you think the, the legacy of this show, interesting to ponder just because it wasn't that, that well watched. And the confusing na- nature of the narrative means it's never going to be that much of a popular show. Um, I still think it's pretty, pretty obviously a, a success. So yeah, um, absolutely. very happy with it. Yeah. And just to kind of drive home your other point, I do hope um, different TV executives see Legion and recognize that even if this is a show that not a lot of people watch that stylistically and artistically, mm-hmm. it's, it's top tier and that they start investing in shows like this because right. the more and more that TV gets fractured and especially i think as the streaming age kind of starts to propel to the next uh stage of everybody having their own platform you're not going to get the huge ratings anymore so i think having things that you can look back at and be proud of and feel really curate right. what you want your channel to be might you know legion is a great example for that yeah you know coming to think of it something that i think is pretty similar in terms of uh these ideas would be maniac from last year on netflix mm. and maniac got no love at the Emmys and that would have been nice to at least get some noms for Maniac, which certainly is a show deserving of some attention just to show the executives that like the prestige that, Hey, there is uh, worth in this kind of uh, uh, on, on traditional storytelling. So hopefully uh, we'll get some more stuff soon. Absolutely. And I think we're going to wrap up there for today. Dave, what do we got for next week? Yeah, next week, uh, there's actually a lot of stuff. We won't be talking about all of this, but obviously Glow Season 3 just dropped. We'll be talking about that uh, season in full. Very excited about that. Uh, And then on the movie front, we have Blinded by the Light. That's that Bruce Springsteen English film. Yeah. That has great reviews. Seen that show for a while. Um, Could be another Yesterday-esque hit in the box office. We will see. 
I'm also very interested in Good Boys, the Seth Rogen produced comedy, because it just looks really funny. And then Where Do You Go Bernadette, which we haven't seen reviews for yet, but it's from Richard Linklater and starring Kate Blanchett and based on a popular novel. Um, that movie has potential for sure. So we'll probably talk about one, at least one of those. And then The Righteous Gemstones premieres on HBO on Sunday with John Goodman, The Next yeah, Jenny yeah. McBride, Jody Hill show. Very excited about that. And then on the music front, Cousin Stiz, the most famous Boston rapper, drops a new album literally on Wednesday of all days. So get that early listen in. And then on Friday, Hoodie Allen and ASAP Ferg are dropping. So a lot of stuff to talk about. So we'll get to a bunch of that. Our guy, Hoodie, he's back. Um, I'm excited to see that. So to, to listen to Hoodie, Mindhunter. Obviously, I'm not going to get to it next week. But, oh, that's right. Mindhunter, uh, too. Friday. Can't wait. So a lot of good stuff. Stay tuned. Hit that subscribe button and go to at Nostalgia Pod. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, we appreciate you. Give us all the feedback. We'll see you next week.